You should have your sheet in front of you that looks like this. We are going to be, Eddie, I don't need you to respond. We are going to, you are going to be filling in the blanks on this sheet as we go through today's lesson. Um, we will have lots of discussion um, for the lesson um, in regards to what we're going to be discussing on today. So let's uh, take a look here. Sorry, I'm in the middle of teaching. I'm taping. All right, so looking at fossils as time marches on, that's what we're going to be going over and doing as of right now. So when we look at our first statement here, let's break this down first. It says the remain or remains or physical evidence preserved by geologic process. Now, what does the word preserve mean? Go, go, go sit down. You're fine, go sit down. What does the word preserve mean? To save, to save or sustain. Very good. So it's to keep it like it is. Give me some examples of how you preserve things. Janie. Put it in a jar. So we preserve in a jar. By putting things in the fridge. Putting it in the refrigerator. Very good. What do you mean frosted? Do you know when it's cold outside? Okay, all right, okay. So that's really basically freezing it. You can preserve things by taking a picture. That's preserving memories. Very good. Anything else? What about how you preserve your shoes or your sneakers? What do you do? You keep them in the box. Some of you keep them clean. Some of you walk funny so you don't crease them. So you're trying to keep them in their original state. I've seen, I've seen you do it. All right, um, so these are remains or physical evidence preserved by geologic process. What is geologic? What's geo? What's geo, Drew? The study of like, oh, I mean, like. What is geo? I mean. Crustacea. Earth. Earth. So basically it's talking about remains or physical evidence preserved, meaning stuff that has been kept the way that it was by earthly processes. What are this? What is this? What are we referring to here? Remains. That means something that's left over. Fossils. Fossils. You'll notice in this lesson, everything in orange is, these are the things that you're writing, the things that are in orange, LaDrica. Fossils tell us a couple things. Some of the things they can tell us are clues about organisms that lived long ago. That is a given. We know that. We've learned that way back when we first started talking about fossils when we were little. We know that it's clues of things that live long ago. Gentlemen, you should not be talking while I'm talking. Fossils can also provide evidence how the Earth's surface has changed over time. And we say, how do we know that? Well, when we look at the Earth layers and we find fossils, we can see how fossils may be similar or organisms may have been similar from other organisms from the past. So we can see that they may have changed. They may not be the same exact organism, but they have some similarities, so they've changed over time. We may notice that some fossils of marine life are on mountains. If we see a fossil of marine life on a mountain, what could that possibly tell us, Bryson? That mountain was underwater at some point. That mountain could have been underwater at some point. Christasia, close that computer up. Fossils also tell us what past environments may have been like, and that's the same example about the mountain and the marine life fossil. In that cup up there, the silver cup. Are we good? Okay, I'll wait a moment. Uh, Bryson. Hit one of the lights while you're up. Is one already down? Yeah, one's okay, already Okay, it's fine. Are we good? Come on, where are those glasses at? 
What are them glasses you had on the other day? All right. These are types of fossils. When we look at these, we, we've seen some of these. These are some things you've seen in a museum, you've seen on television, um, you may have seen in another, someone else's classroom or things of that nature, in a book. You've seen these things. We're going to break down what these types of fossils are. So on your notes, we're now under the heading that says types of fossils. One type is called a petrified fossil. What do you think of when you hear the word petrified? It's like, ooh, they're petrified. Like scared. Scared. And what happens normally when you're afraid? Freeze. You freeze up. And petrified means stone. It's frozen like stone, just like Medusa. Medusa was so petrifying, she turned people into stone just by looking at her. And that's where the word petrified comes from because it means stone. So when you're blank, you're putting petrified equals stone. You're writing everything that's in orange. So the fossils that you see in the museum, they're not, like this fossil here, they're not the bones of the fossil. Bones are brittle. Over time, bones will decay. What happens is the minerals and the water, they replace that bone. They kind of encapsulize it, and it turns into stone. And that stone is what we find as the fossils because it is the evidence of past life. And we put those stones together to sim uh, assimilate what we believe that organisms look like. Any questions? All right. Then the second type of fossil that we're going to talk about are molds. This is your second check mark. And molds are imprints. You've all done something where you played with Play-Doh and you pressed your hand in it or you pressed a ring in it or you pressed something in it and you made an imprint. Or you stepped in a mud puddle and you made your footprint. Or you stepped in the cement with your foot so you could have a foot puddle, footprint. Or um, on uh, television or if you've ever been to California, on Hollywood Boulevard, you would see the handprints of the stars. Those are molds, meaning they've made a mold of, of something that they wanted to preserve. In this case... Looking at the different rock layers, if an organism dies and they have a shell or some type of outer casing, that's going to be there. It's going to, the organism is going to die, but it's going to leave that mold there. So we can still see the evidence of life. We see that mold there, so we know that this was something. In this case, this is an ammonite, and these are the little swirlies that we normally draw when we're drawing in our rock layers. The other type is a cast. So after the ampersand sign, you're writing the word cast because they go hand in hand. A cast is a mold feeling. So what happens is, um, a cast is a result of a mold, and what happens is you have this mold, you have this indentation of something. And minerals and water fills into that place, and it creates a cast. Um, so it fills up that mold, and it gives us what that may be, or may have been, creating some type of petrified fossil. It's like putting your hand in... Um, the clay, making that mold, and then pouring in some cement or wax so you can have a little statue of whatever that was. Any questions? Okay. Then the third example of a fossil is a carbon film. Now, a carbon film is kind of like a fingerprint of the fossil. You've all played when you were younger and sticked your fingers in um, a ink pad or paint and you made little fingerprints. Um, characters or things of that nature. You may have made a turkey around Thanksgiving time. You did the whole hand and then you drew feathers on it. Those are your fingerprints or just being little and touching on stuff. Your parents know where you were in the house because of your little, little nasty fingerprints are all over everything, the windows. This is like a fingerprint of a fossil. And because all living things are made of a certain element called carbon amongst other elements, carbon is an element that is in living things. So all living things do contain the element carbon. Now carbon takes 5,370 years to decay a half-life. So in 5,730 5, years, it's going to still be half of the carbon that was remaining in the organism, the element remaining in the organism. So therefore, over a long period of time, they are still going to be able to see carbon there, and carbon is able to leave these imprints. 
So this is why radiometric dating is often called carbon dating, because carbon is going to be the most likely element there. Any questions? Yes? Um, can an organism, since people who have lung problems, I mean, like, say the organism, if it's burned or something, will it still have carbon? It's still going to be carbon there because carbon is an organism that is within there. And then the fire, too, burning of it, it's, all it's doing is getting rid of the remains of whatever it is, but the element is still there. Good question. All right, moving on. Our next type of fossil, this should be our fourth check mark, is a trace fossil. And you all know what tracing is. Even in the time of Thanksgiving, instead of doing your handprint, you may have traced your hand. So you can have what your hand looks like for a turkey. And your, your parents probably saved that, not because the turkey picture was pretty, but because it saved your little handprint on there. How many of you drew uh, traced your hand before? Oh, I've seen some of you place the paper along your Chromebook and trace a cartoon. Tracing is just outlining exactly what is there. And you're outlining it there so that you can get the object to be as similar as possible to what it was. Trace fossils are fossils that show us activities of organisms. What do we mean by activities of organisms? What do we mean? What's an activity? Why are you guys sitting here looking like I'm asking about quantum physics? Jamil, what they do, what types of things do things do? That's a question. What types of things do things do? Move. Move. Hunt. Hunt. Eat. 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 Communicate is another one, yes. All those activities trace fossils help us. So on your paper, you have the word examples. We are obviously about to write examples of what? Trace fossils. We just wrote what these, the trace fossils, we're about to write examples of trace fossils. The first example is tracks. Now this is in yellow, so you're writing what's in yellow for this little portion. Not hair tracks, but tracks like, like um, stuff that's left behind, movement, footprints, things of that nature. This is a picture of some little footprints. Tracks tell us the size of an animal and the speed of the movement. Someone raise your hand and tell me ex to explain to me how tracks could tell us the size of the animal. Aaliyah. Just like there's little footprints, you know that it's not an animal too big. It's bigger than you know if it's much larger. Possibly. You could have a small animal with really big feet. But what about if the imprint was really deep? Then you know that was probably a... It was a heavy or a bigger animal because it made a deep impression or a deep track. Um, this right here, looking at this example... Of a trait of, a, of tracks, what could we conclude about this organism, Patrick? Okay, we could possibly say it was lightweight. What else could we conclude? No, you cannot conclude that from this um, these footprints. It could be pretty fast because the footprints are very close together. Small. They might be more than one. They traveled in packs because there's so many footprints. Um, Akaya? It might have nails, maybe strong, some little claws or nails maybe there. So we can tell that. And we, so we just told about the size of the animal and the speed of the movement. Very good. Any questions? Okay. Then the second example would be burrows. Now, burrows are buried shelters. They're little holes that, have, that the organism has buried itself in. We know from this that this is not going to be a small organism. I'm sorry, not going to be a big organism, meaning that big organisms aren't going to bury themselves in these little holes, but small organisms. Now, let's say next to this fossil, type of trace fossil, we saw large footprints that were deep impressions. What can we conclude about the both of them, Patrick? I need an answer when you have your hand. I'm expecting an answer. Aaron. Maybe the large animal is the predator to the small animal. That's a possibility you could conclude that. Could we possibly conclude the small animal may terrorize the large animal? 
You could possibly say that too. You saw on television shows where the smaller animals gang up on the larger one, they start tearing apart at it. Right. They start just tearing apart at the um, organism. Yes. Meerkats, yes, definitely. Meerkats from the Lion King, they live in little burrows. All right? So that's your second example. Our third example is called coprolite. You could probably say crapolite because it is preserved animal poop. Now, some of you will ask the question, is this sanitary? If this is bacteria, what you have to remember, this is not the actual poop. It is fossilized, meaning, first of all, we all know that poop breaks down. When it, someone yes. poops in the grass, or not someone, hopefully, something poops in the grass, it will, uh, <laughs> it will decay and it will break down into the earth. So it will be earth going back to earth. However... With an organism like this, or organisms from the past, it being a fossil, it may be fossilized. It could be petrified, turned into stone. Um, so we'd be able to capture that. What type of things can we conclude from coprolite? What it ate? What about the size of the organism? Yes. Yeah, we know little small organisms aren't going to produce, well, most likely would not produce big coprolite. All right. Are we good? You have another check mark. What is that check mark going to be talking about? Lo notice the format of your notes. Another type of fossil. The next type of fossil, these are called preserved remains. And it equals, they're close to the original state. So now, these are the types of fossils that we really didn't have to do much to except get it out of its environment and put it in a museum so everyone else can see. No, nope, dinosaurs, those are the petrified fossils that we had to put back together and assume that that's what they are like. These are close to their original remains, meaning that we were able to capture them as close to what they already were. We did not have to do anything. One second. Drinka? Is it like a dodo bird? Kind of. They kind of guessed about it. Bryson? Mm hmm. Um, does that include like the eggs and animals? Yes, yes, because those are preserved in its original state. Um, an example, like Eddie just brought up amber. So you have amber being your first example. These are examples of preserved remains. And amber is uh, equals caught in tree sap. It's called raisin, R-E-S-I-N, but we can call it tree sap for sake of a better term. And what happens is if an insect was to get caught in this raisin, it would actually just be stuck there. And when it's stuck there, it hardens. This stuff hardens like glass. And when it hardens like glass, that organism is there. It's wings, it's antennas, it's everything. It is not going to get older. It's not going to decay. It's preserved. Remember, we talked about preserved being stuck in its original state. So it's preserved. So we can look at it and see exactly what it looks like and exactly what it was like because it's stuck in this stuff. Isn't that what they do with the butterflies? Yes, sometimes they do that with the butterflies. But they most likely put them in, 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 in case. So they do something simulate this. This happens in nature. But they automatically get preserved in amber. But they do that with the butterflies to assimilate this so that we can actually see the butterflies from there. All right. The other, another example of preserved remains would be tar. Now, this is a mammoth that has gotten trapped in a tar pit. So tar equals trapped in tar pit. And what happens is, remember, tar is what we make our streets off of. And that hardens also. So once this organism has gotten stuck in a tar pit, it is going to remain exactly like that. The tar is going to preserve the outer organs, the inner organs, and we're able to see it for what it is, covered in tar, however. Mm, kind of. An example, an example. Yes. Yes. Um, I have two 
Okay. Is that one, is that one? He just asked that question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean. Oh, okay. Anyways. Um, so, do you like to use water or something? Well, there, remember, we are more sophisticated than animals. We can think, we can analyze, we can conclude because we can talk. Animals can, animals are living in nature. And of course, they have an assumption that nature is what it should be natural. So yes, he most likely probably did assume that it was a natural thing, just like in Happy Feet. Anything in the ocean, they assume they can eat because everything in the ocean, they're supposed to be able to eat. But once we humans come along and start doing things to the environment, changing it up, we can't communicate with the animals and say, hey, you know what, this is, uh, it might not want to eat that because that's garbage. And the animal's like, oh, thanks for telling me it's garbage. I won't eat it. doesn't happen that way. Well, but you got to remember, too, organisms in the environment, it changes over time due to just the changing of the environment. So something like this could have happened within the environment because of the changes of the environment. Ashes, volcanic ashes, linking up with things of that nature. Good question. That lets me know you're thinking. The another, another example would be ice. Like the ice age, which is what Akaya just brought up, right? And this would be, and then um, also Bryson talked about the woolly mammoth. And the woolly mammoth uh, in the Ice Age, or organisms in the Ice Age, they freeze. And we talked about things freezing. Put it away. Things freezing and us putting things in a freezer um, so that we can preserve it. So if things in nature, they freeze, they're preserved. And over time, it even preserves the hair. So preserving even the hair. Of an organism. So this is one of the ways we can see the organism exactly for what it is. That's exactly why we freeze meat, so we can preserve it to its original when we bought it, so we don't, it doesn't go bad. Yes. Tar pit. Yes. It's tar, it's not quicksand, but what happens is it's sticky, so it's hard to get out because it's sticky. And then it sticks to everything on you. And it clogs your lungs if it gets in there. Shh. Bryson? It doesn't preserve the hair. It preserves things like the bones and stops the bones from decaying. Okay. All right, now, this words are not going to pop up here. You have, we have to come up with our own conclusion, so your wording is going to be your wording. But like we mentioned before, marine fossils found on a mountaintop indicates what? That mountain, that mountain was once underwater. Maybe that was an ocean area. It formed in a different environment. That's why I have in parentheses, like the bottom of the ocean. What theory does this support? Pangea. And if you don't remember what Pangea is, you might want to write a little example underneath. What is Pangea? Raise your hand and tell me. Um, Rajalyn. A large mass of continents. A large uh, continent. And what happened? They broke apart. Continental drift. So if you do not remember that, what Pangea was, you want to write that there. Isn't true that the earth could possibly go back into Pangea? Or will it still just break apart and go Oh, I have a better question. Do rock layers get, like, connect back together? They're not separate. Huh? They're not separate. I mean, not rock layers, but, you know, he was talking about it. Remember that time you look at somebody and you squint their eyes, your eyes because you, you are trying to make them disappear? No. Every day I do. All right. History of changing organisms. Now, scientists study the relationship between these fossils so they can determine how what? What are they trying to determine, Jenny? Um, how life was in the past. Yep. How life has changed over time or how life was in the past. Why is that important? Why are we looking for life changing, Jenny? The past is the key to the present. The past is the key to the present. And if we know 
what, how the past has changed and got us here, we can be able to determine the future. future. Not saying that we're psychic and we have a globe, but we can be able to determine what's going to happen in later years or even later days. What do you think meteorologists do? They're fortune tellers. They're future tellers, aren't they? Because they tell you. Sometimes they're wrong, but for the most part, they have been on point. All right? So for this example, older rock layers contain organisms that often differ from uh, uh, organisms in younger rock layers. So able to tell us that evolution has happened, Eddie. I need your undivided attention. Now, using foxes to date rocks, do not yell this out. I want you to just write it down, and if you do not get this right, I am going to scream. But these things are used to establish the age of the rock layer because they are only found in the rock layer of one geologic time. Write your answer down. Do not raise your hand. And I, we have said this word over 100 times in here, so you better get it right. Simon, what is this answer? Index fossil. Everyone say because it was one geologic time. Yes. One. Everyone. One geologic time. Put up your finger one. What finger is your finger one? Index finger. Therefore, we are talking about the index fossil. Thank you. All right. Turn your paper over to the back, Patrick. You need to study. Oh, Drew. <laughs> All right, papers on the back. Now that we study these fossils, we know that fossils are located in rock layers, and there we study the divisions of time so that we can understand the evolution, how fossils has evolutionized, how Earth has evolutionized, and how it has changed over time. The divisions of time are broken down. It starts in one large, large division, breaks down to a smaller division, to a smaller, all the way down to a smaller division, and we look at these different divisions and we study them. And in a moment, you're going to be able to look at these different divisions and see um, video on how these divisions were and how time has changed and how things have changed over time. Words are not going to pop up here. But the largest division of geologic time is called an eon. E-O-N. These were your part of your vocabulary. So when someone says eons and eons ago, that means a long, long, long time ago because these are your larger divisions of time. Our next unit of geologic time is shorter than an eon, and it includes more two or more periods, and this is called an era. E-R-A, an era. So in a specific time era, this is what people are talking about. The next geologic unit of time is divided from an era but it's larger than something we call an epoch, and this is a period. Yeah. These are periods of time. <laughs> periods are then broken down to geologic units, which are called epochs. E-P-O-C-H. Epochs. E Not epic. E epoch. E-P-O-C-H. Oh. Now you have a chart that looks like this, which should be showing. One second. You have your chart. All right, so you have your, um, excuse me. You have your chart that looks like this. We're going to go through this chart. Now, we know that in geologic time, we the oldest starts at the bottom. So just like this geologic time scale, the oldest is going to start at the bottom. What's the oldest thing called down there? Hadean. And it's the largest. Notice it's a large time division. So it's the Hadean what? Yeah. You two cut it out. Stop, Drica. This is the Hadean eon. So you want to make sure you include that. And the Hadean Eon goes all the way from 300.8 billion years ago to 4.6 billion years ago. And this explains why we say that our Earth 
is 400.6 billion years old because we're able to study back, back that far. And if you look over to the left-hand part of the margin, you will see that only rocks, um, the only rocks that scientists found during this eon were rocks from meteorites and rocks from the moon. No life form. The next part is Archaean. And that is called a what? That's also an eon. And then you have the Proterozoic eon. Now the Archaean eon, if you look on the left-hand margin, it tells us how many billion years old that is. And that's where the scientists have found the earliest known rocks forming um, this eon. And the Proterozoic eon, this is where uh, scientists find the first organisms with well-developed cells. So this is where they first see some form of life. They say billion years. Uh -uh. Now, oftentimes in your studies or when you're looking or we're learning, you're not going to really hear them say Hadean and Archaean and Protozoic. You're actually just going to hear them say the Precambrian, Precambrian Eon. So make sure you put a bracket and you label that the Precambrian Eon. So the Precambrian Eon is going to include our three um, eons, Hadean, Archaean, and Protozoic Eon. And the reason, the most reason probably why they do that is because in this area they located rocks and then they first started locating um, life forming the well-developed um, cells were found here. The next eon is the Phanozoic Eon. That's the one on the green, and this is where the divisions actually start. But in this eon, rocks and fossils recorded mainly, they represent, um, and this is the eon where we actually live in. But starting from the bottom, going up, we have these things that are in, located in a division. We have the uh, Paleozoic, everyone say that? Paleozoic. Mesozoic. Mesozoic. Cenozoic. Cenozoic. These are what? Yeah. These are not eons. These are your eras. So the Precambrian eon does not have any eras. The Phanozoic eon has eras, being the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic era. Those eras are then broken down to periods. In the Paleozoic era, you have, say it with me, Cambrian, Cambrian. Ordovician, Solarian, Solarian, Devonian, Devonian Mississippian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian. Pennsylvania. However, those two <laughs> stop stop repeating. Those two are combined, and those are often referred to as the Carboniferous period. So you want to go ahead and bracket those as the Carboniferous period. And then you have the Permian. Everyone say that. Permian. Permian period. Yes. No, no, they're not random. These names mean something. They derive from something. So Carboniferous obviously means that you're going to have something that has to do with carbon. In your, in your studies, when you um, break down to your next unit that you're going to be doing, you will understand why they've named certain things like this, like the Devonian um, was named after a scientist um, and that. Um, but so you'll be able to see why they've been named what they've been named. Uh-huh. And then all these uh, names are named after, I mean, they took these names for the little cities and stuff. Most likely. But you, Most likely, but you, like I just told you, you'll be able to see that when you break down into your unit of studying each of them. The next era is the Mesozoic era. And the Mesozoic era is broken down into three periods, one being the Triassic, Triassic Jurassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. 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 All right. Then our next era is the Cenozoic. That's broken down into the Tertiary period and the Quaternary. And then you have the next subunits called Epochs. Now, uh-uh, say it correctly. In this, you have, in the tertiary period, you have the, paleo, the Paleocene, Eocene, Eocene, 
Allergocene, and Myosine, and the Pilocene. Then there's the quaternary period, and that's broken down into the Pleistocene and the Holocene. Which, which era do we belong to? Raise your hand. Bryson. I'm sorry. Said as our guest, but my question should have been which eon do we belong to? Aaliyah. Um, the, the eon. eon. Um, Brian. No, no, you gotta say it. Jenny. Jenny. What eon? Patrick, help her out. The Phanerozoic. Which era again, Bryson? Cenozoic. What period do we belong to, Eddie? Eddie. Quaternary. That's an end. What epoch do we belong to, Drew? The Holocene epoch. Good. Any questions with that? All right. Then you need to... Take out your paper that looks like this. This is where you got from the tray in the front in the beginning of class. We're still in instruction. All right. You'll notice on this paper it says page blank and then it has a one. That's because it's front back. So you're going to label Trika. This is still uh, page um, 13, so it'll be 13 dash 1 dash 2 dash 3, so that way if your pages come separate, you know what page of the 13 it was. Now, your direction says think about geologic time scale. That's the scale that's on your notes, and that comes from the looking at fossils as time marches on. These are the notes we just completed. While viewing the video, because you're going to be watching a video titled A Glimpse of Earth's Past. When viewing that video, you are going to record information presented about each segment for the proper categories listed below. Now, in those categories, you will see a portion of it that's asking about ge excuse me, geologic settings. Geologic settings are referring to this, the time era, the, the time period that it was there, but the ge geology of it, meaning you're looking at land masses, mountains, if there were volcanic, if mountains formed during that time, if oceans, Ladrica, get on Earth, come back from La La Land. If oceans formed, if mountains formed, um, if there were different continents that then formed during that time. So you're looking at that setting. How was that setting up? Just like a play. What is the setting during that time um, division? Um, so when you look at each of yours, you will see. For instance, number one is only talking about the Precambrian Eon. Remember, the Precambrian Eon contains the Protozoic, the Archaean, and the Hadean Eon. When you look at your next one, you'll notice that that's only talking about the Cambrian period. But it breaks it down and it tells you that the Cambrian period is part of the Paleozoic era, which is part of the um, Phanozoic Eon. So as you're going through, you're going to be putting down the geologic setting. You're going to put down the life, if there was life there. And you're going to put down the climate, so what the climate was like during that time division as well. For our first question, before we go on to watching the video, and if you're watching this online, the video is in my website link, but for the rest of you, you all be watching it on your Chromebook in a moment. But in what ways can people, people being us, benefit by studying the Earth's history? How can we benefit by studying Earth's history? Huh? I want I want communication right now, Bryson. That's a good way, so we can know how to unlock our future. What does that mean, though? That is very good. I love that wording. Oh, that means you're on the right track. Don't let your mind stop you. Roger, Lynn. We can know what to expect. Things like what, though? What type of things are we trying to anticipate? Oh, the different animals in the way the earth moves. 
Okay, the way the earth moves. If we know how the way the earth moves, what can that help us to predict? And we watch it every day so we can know what to wear. Weather, weather patterns. What else? Natural disasters. Yes, you need to be jotting these things down. Weather patterns, natural disasters. What else? What about locating coal? What's coal? Coal is what we get what from? We do get heat, but heat is produced from? Yes. Gas. We need to know that because what does our transportation and our life depend on? Gas. So we need to know that as well. And then, like, like you all mentioned, environmental changes. Those are things that you need to know. Now, maybe in your mind as a child, you think that this hasn't really benefited me. Why do I need to know this? Over time, you will need to know because you are growing. You're going to be going, picking a college soon in your life. Although you're going to be picking, trying to pick the college that is more interesting to your needs of where you want to study, say, for instance, you're thinking about going to California. I It's not the time to start throwing up your college sign. Um, you want to think about in, in certain areas I might not want to live there because those are high in volcanoes those may be high in earthquakes I might not want to work there or you get jobs and certain things you think about with jobs are things like you may have to study the past so you can determine what the future will be like or what the present is going to be like so those are different things you want to look at so at this moment, you're going to be taking out your Chromebooks. You're going to go to my website. And on the website, uh, guys, don't start talking. On my website, you're looking at today's date, and you are going to click on the link next to a glimpse of Earth's past, and you're going to be watching the video and filling out the blanks on your paper. Do you think they need to be in complete sentences? Yay. No, they don't, because this is your notes. Um, Duran, we have aisles that we walk down. We don't cut in between. That's why the seats are close like that. So make sure, make sure you are paying attention to the video and you are jotting down these things. Don't waste your time trying to write in complete sentences. And this is going to conclude this portion of the lesson.